China. Well, China is on everybody's lips right now, and we're going to look at China in this five-part series from the point of view of the Bible and of history. Yes, China is in the Bible, and the Bible outlines not only its history, but its future. So the first question we want to ask in this five-part series is, is war with China inevitable? Yes, that's right. The Bible does have an answer. So in this series, we're looking at China from five perspectives. First of all, China's origins in Genesis. Secondly, looking at the Sinites, the original Chinese, migrating across to China, where it is today. And thirdly, China's 100 years of humiliation, as they even refer to it themselves from the 1840s to the 1940s, post the Second World War. We'll look at that period of time. And then China's astonishing rise since 1978 in particular uh, to our own day. So over the last 40 years, China has astonished the world with its growth and now its perceived dominance. And lastly, China's future in God's plan, because God does have a purpose. And it's referred to in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 49. And from there, we can also draw other conclusions from other parts of scripture about China's future in the plan of God. So here we are, number one, China's origins in the book of Genesis. First of all, China has reached in 2021 1.4 billion people, the largest by population nation on the earth. And also it's getting very close to being the largest by economic size in the world. So in the last 40 years, China has burst out of the bottle, we might say, like a genie coming out of the lamp, like magic. And people are asking, how is China ever going to be put back into its bottle? Well, as we said, China is identified in the Bible. And these are the points that we're going to be looking at during our series of five studies. First of all, we'll establish that China is among the 70 nations mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 10. China is descended from the Canaanites, and we'll show that quite clearly from the scripture. And as a result of the curse that was placed on the Canaanites in the early chapters of Genesis, the curse given by Noah, and of course Noah being a man of God, a curse applies to all the generations following. So they've inherited the curse placed upon the Canaanites. Then after the Tower of Babel, they were scattered to the far east of the Eurasian landmass as they exist in China today. Their role under that curse is to be servants. In fact, Noah said they would be servants of servants, the Canaanites. As a result of them being cursed to become servants, they've actually developed some remarkable strengths and skills down through history. And that's obvious from what is happening in China today. Uh, they're now attempting over the last 40 years to break out of the time of servitude that they've experienced through history. But God is going to judge them in accordance with that curse that he placed originally in the book of Genesis. However, though there will be a diminished people when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to set up the kingdom of God, they will be there to worship in the kingdom and we'll show that from the scriptures. So in the last 40 years, without knowing about the Genesis curse placed on the Canaanites, China is trying to break free of the servant status. Here's an interesting video from Professor Graham Allison from the United States. 40 years ago, 1978, China sets out on its march to the market. At that point, what percentage of China's 1 billion citizens were struggling to survive on less than $2 a day? Take a guess. 25%? 50? 75? 90. What do you think? 90. Nine out of every 10 on less than $2 a day. 
2018, 40 years later, what about the numbers? What's your bet? Take a look. Fewer than one in a hundred today. And China's president has promised that within the next three years, those last tens of millions will have been raised up above that threshold. So it's a miracle, actually, in our lifetime. A seemingly unstoppable rising China, accelerating towards an apparently immovable ruling U.S., on course for what could be the grandest collision in history. Uh, former Czech president, Václav Havel, I think, put it best. He said, all this has happened so fast, we haven't yet had time to be astonished. <laughs> okay. To remind myself how astonished I should be, I occasionally look out the window in my office in Cambridge at this bridge which goes across the Charles River between the Kennedy School and Harvard Business School. In 2012, the state of Massachusetts said they were going to renovate this bridge. It would take two years. In 2014, they said it wasn't finished. Uh, in 2015, they said it would take one more year. In 2015, they said it's not finished. We're not going to tell you when it's going to be finished. <laughs> Finally, last year, it was finished three times over budget. Now, compare this to a similar bridge that I drove across last month in Beijing. It's called the Senyan Bridge. In 2015, the Chinese decided they wanted to renovate that bridge. It actually has twice as many lanes of traffic. How long did it take for them to complete the project? 2015. What do you bet? Take a guess. Okay. Take a look. The answer is 43 hours. Compare the U.S. and China to kids on opposite ends of a seesaw on a playground, each represented by the size of their economy. As late as 2004, China was just half our size. By 2014, its GDP was equal to ours. And on the current trajectory, by 2024, it'll be half again larger. The consequences of this tectonic change will be felt everywhere. The past 500 years have seen 16 cases in which a rising power threatened to displace a ruling power. Twelve of those ended in war. Yes, isn't that interesting? And here's the table. Uh, you can pause the video if you wish to have a closer look at it. But as Professor Allison said, uh, over the last 500 years, uh, there have been 16 major times in which a rising power has overtaken the ruling power. And in the red colour on the right-hand column, you'll see those 12 times in the red colour and the blue where there was no war. But looking right back to wars in Europe, the Ottoman Empire, of course, and coming down through the time when Britain and and France were at war with one another, one rising above the other for a time, through the 19th century and into the 20th century and the two great world wars where Germany was the rising power and also Japan. Uh, and that's the question, is China as the rising power going to be going to war with other nations and particularly with the United States as being the existing ruling power? We need really to go back right to the origins of China and we'll look in the Bible at Genesis chapter 10. China, we'll see, is amongst the 70 nations of Genesis chapter 10. And the history of China and the present position of China all relates back to its origins. China, we'll see, is descended from the Canaanites and they've inherited the curse of the Canaanites, the curse of servitude. So looking at the flood in 2344 BC, roughly, the flood took place. And at that time, every person in all the earth perished in the great flood, except for the eight people who were saved in the ark. When they came out of the ark, they populated the world. Where did the 1.4 billion people in China come from? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 9, first of all. In Genesis chapter 9, we read of the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark, 
Shem and Ham and Japheth. Ham, notice, is the father of Canaan. That's specified for us very early uh, in the record of the lives of people who come out of the ark. Ham is the father of Canaan. He's uh, specifically mentioned. And then from these three sons of Noah, the whole of the earth was overspread. So everyone, wherever you live, wherever you are in the world, you all came from the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham and Japheth. So after the flood, as we go on and read, we read that uh, an event took place which was a disgraceful event in the life of Noah and indeed his family. And Noah drank wine and he was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham and Canaan are involved there in a, an incident that affected Noah, who was uh, the father of Ham and the grandfather of Canaan. We need to go into the details of that, but Shem and, Ham, uh, Shem and Japheth uh, acted honourably in this situation. And so blessings were placed upon Shem and Japheth by Noah, the great prophet of God as he was, uh, and uh, they affected uh, them and their descendants, and a particular curse was placed upon Canaan. Reading on in Genesis chapter 9, Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his younger son had done unto him, and he said, Cursed be Canaan. So specifically, Canaan is cursed. And we're told, A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And again, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. So Japheth and Shem will have a particular relationship, and Canaan shall be his servant too. Well, looking a little bit further at what happened as a result of the, uh, uh, the families coming out of the ark, Shem, Ham and Japheth and their wives, uh, of course we read of their children in uh, uh, the later chapters of Genesis, particularly from Genesis 10. So Shem is the father of the Semitic peoples, that is, generally speaking, the Jews and the Arabs. Ham, the father, we'll look at the four sons of Ham. And Japheth is the father of the European races, the Caucasians. So of Ham, we read, he had four sons. The first was Canaan, and Canaan himself had 11 sons. Then we have Mitzrayim, which is the Hebrew name for Egypt. And then we have Cush, uh, who's the father of the uh, peoples of Ethiopia and southern African areas. And uh, from Foot, we have Libya and the northern African people. So we're looking particularly at the descendants of Ham, and especially Canaan. Now Ham's sons, we know from history, were mighty builders. Uh, when we read of the Canaanite cities, when the children of Israel came uh, up out of Egypt and went to an, uh, into the inheritance in the promised land, the report was that the Canaanite cities were walled up to heaven. They were mighty cities. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and other parts of the scripture tell us about that. And of uh, the sons of Cush, we read particularly of Nimrod, uh, the infamous uh, son of Cush, uh, who began the concept of towers and cities, and particularly the Tower of Babel. In Egypt, we have the, uh, the descendants of Mitzrayim, and uh, you can see the pyramids there. So reading further after the flood in Genesis chapter 10, we have a uh, summary of the 70 nations of the world that uh, came from the descendants of uh, Noah in the early days. Of Canaan, we read of his 11 sons. And you can see there from the top, uh, the firstborn was Sidon. Uh, he uh, occupied the area of uh, Lebanon today. Heth, the Hittites, Jebusites uh, occupied the area of Jerusalem. And others that we read of, we know the Amorites, the Gergesites, the Hivites and the Archites were all in that uh, area of Canaan called the Promised Land. Then, of course, we have the Sinite, the eighth son of Canaan. And from the Sinite, the uh, name of the young man would have been Sin, and uh, the name Sinite uh, generated from that. And uh, we'll see where they went. The Avadite, the Zemurite, the Hamathite, we can see uh, from history where they settled. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a moment. In Genesis chapter 10, we read from verses 15 to 18, 
Canaan begets Sidon, he is firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite, our particular interest, and the Arvidite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite. And notice this, particularly it says of the Canaanites, that afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. How did that happen? We go to Genesis chapter 11, and uh, we read of the fact that they were gathering together uh, to build the Tower of Babel. And the purpose of building that tower was that there was uh, an influence which appeared to be uh, uh, impacting upon the people of the day to spread them abroad, to scatter them abroad further afield. Well, the angels uh, came down and they saw what was going on. People were saying, let's build a tower to reach to heaven. Uh, in other words, let's try and make ourselves uh, uh, opponents of God, uh, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And, of course, we had read in Genesis chapter 10 that particularly the Canaanites uh, were cursed to be spread abroad. Well, Genesis 11 says, So the Lord went down and scattered them abroad upon the face of all the earth by of course, confusing their languages. The Lord there confounded the language of all the earth, and the name Babel means confusion, because the languages were confused, the people couldn't work together, and as a result, they were scattered abroad upon the face of all the earth. Uh, part of the, uh, the influence of that scattering uh, came from Nimrod himself, who was, we read, the instigator of the building of the Tower of Babel. Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and other places. He reckoned Akkad and Cana in the land of Shinar, which is the area of the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, what's known as the Fertile Crescent. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, the building of that tower. And of course, Babylon uh, developed there later on. So Nimrod was quite unhappy about the fact that his uh, dream of a tower wasn't going to be completed. And uh, it appears that because of his uh, anger, uh, he drove people away. The Bible says he was a hunter. Well, what did he hunt? Did he hunt rabbits? Uh, did he hunt foxes? Maybe deer? Did he hunt lions? Well, no, it's more likely that he was a hunter of men. The same Hebrew word is used of Hitler and men like him who hunted the Jews back to their land, as Jeremiah prophesied in chapter 16. I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them, and after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, from every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. So you can imagine Nimrod hunting these people away in his anger and saying, well, why can't we continue with this building? Uh, it's all your fault. He wouldn't be blaming himself, of course. And so he was used by God as uh, one of the influences uh, which drove people further afield. Now, this map shows the spread of the civilization after the flood in general terms. Uh, the uh, tribes of Japheth moved across into Europe. Uh, the uh, children of Ham uh, largely developed the area down towards uh, Africa and spread across uh, further afield from there. And Shem, the Semitic peoples, generally stayed in that region of the Middle East, as we know today, them uh, generally as the Jews and the Arabs. Now, about 2000 BC, so we're talking a few hundred years after the flood, uh, Abraham comes down into the Promised Land. He journeys from Ur of the Chaldees uh, in that uh, Tigris-Euphrates Valley, and he eventually comes to the land occupied by the Canaanites. Genesis 12 tells us that the Canaanite was then in the land, about 2000 BC. Now, a little later, when the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, uh, come back out of the land of Egypt and into the Promised Land, they know that they have to deal with the nations of Canaan who occupied that territory. So of the 11 sons of Canaan listed down the left-hand side of this chart, uh, we have seven nations mentioned when God says uh, through Moses, you're going to come in to the land of promise and you're going to find there seven nations greater and mightier than thou. 
And I've paralleled the top five there. You can see the Hittites. Uh, these are listed in Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites. And then the remaining two of the seven are specified as the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Now, it appears that the word uh, and the name Canaanites uh, marks out those that lived in the walled cities. And the Perizzites, the name Perizzites means village dweller. These are the Canaanites who lived in villages and fields in the land. So they make up the seven nations. Now, what are the other 11 of the 11 sons? Well, Sidon, as we said, was the area of Lebanon. And uh, that wasn't uh, given to the uh, children of Israel to occupy at that time. Then the Arvadites uh, can be identified from Ezekiel as being in the area north of Sidon on the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, the Hamathites, Hamath was a... Uh, an area in northern Syria, mentioned in Numbers 34 and other places. Uh, the Archite, it appears, uh, it speaks of an area in northern Lebanon also. And the Zemurites, uh, that was such a, a small group by the time Israel came into the land that they were incorporated into the inheritance of Benjamin, Joshua chapter 18. Now that leaves the Sinites. And the Sinites, we can tell, uh, occupied the area further south. Now, looking at the map here, we can see the general area that was promised and occupied uh, by the uh, nations of Canaan. Genesis 10 says that uh, the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, up in the north, uh, Lebanon on the coast. As thou comest down the coast to Girah and Gaza, which are uh, running down the coastal area there to the south, and then you go across uh, in a new direction now to the east from Gaza, uh, it brings you to Sodom and Gomorrah, Admar and Zeboim, which are all cities on the southern uh, area of the Dead Sea as it is now. Uh, and uh, then you would be turning northwards and up the eastern side of the Dead Sea to Lasher, which is identified as about halfway up the Dead Sea on the eastern side. An interesting thing about the Canaanites is that in history, they never won a significant war. This map is actually uh, showing the pathways of the uh, countries that were involved, the nations that were involved in the first great battle in the Middle East recorded in the Bible, Genesis chapter 14. The first battle of the Canaanites when they did battle with kings from the north. So the Canaanite kings of those cities on the southern area of their inheritance, uh, as we saw, uh, were the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, Admar and Zeboim and Zor. And uh, they were five kings who were in servitude uh, to the great king of Elam, who was, uh, Elam was the firstborn of Shem. The king's name was Kedileomu. And uh, for 12 years, they uh, were in service. They were servants too, in servitude, and slaves, we might say almost, giving tribute to the kings of the north. But then they rebelled. They tried to rise up against their servitude, their masters. And so the four northern kings who were Shemites uh, came to do battle with these descendants of Canaan, the descendants of Ham, living in that area of the southern part of the Dead Sea. And they did battle in the Vale of Siddim, which later became the Dead Sea after the uh, overthrow of Sodom and those cities. So the Canaanites actually were quickly defeated in this war and many of them fell into sinkholes as they uh, retreated in that Vale of Siddim, which is now the Dead Sea. In fact, there are sinkholes opening up in that area again now. Uh, sinkholes would indicate that this was a very unstable area uh, before the event that overthrew those cities. So the inhabitants of those cities, including Lot, were taken captive uh, once those uh, kings were defeated by the kings of the north. And they were taken north and uh, uh, Abraham became aware of this. And it was only the intervention of Abraham with 318 men uh, that saved those captives. Obviously, that was a miracle uh, from uh, uh, Abraham being a man of God. Uh, God helped in the salvation of those people from those kings that were taking them away, and Abraham uh, restored the goods and the people to their sinful cities. So the Canaanites in history, you can look through 
your Bible and history and find that they've never won a significant war. There were skirmishes and there were times when they were somewhat dominant uh, over parts of Israel, but they never really won a significant war right through history. And we're going to see that neither has China. Looking at their history, we will see that China has also been involved in uh, skirmishes, uh, small uh, battles. Uh, perhaps it was larger when the uh, Mongols were trying to invade there, but uh, it's been a, a lot of uh, internal conflict in China in history, in fact, and they've never really won anything significant in terms of a war. And we'll look particularly at the last uh, 100, 150 years uh, a little later on in our series. So what we've looked at is that China is amongst the 70 nations of Genesis 10, uh, that China is descended from the Canaanites, that they've inherited the curse placed upon the Canaanites, and that's uh, one that stays with them through history. And after the Tower of Babel, they were scattered to the Far East, and their role under the curse is to be servants. Now, in our next series, we're going to look at more historical proof and uh, authorities who uh, have identified the Sinites with China. But in the meantime, let's look at this. China does not see itself as a servant of servants, and certainly not right now, as they are a rising power. Chifu 强国有我, so the leader of China, Xi Jinping, is saying nobody's going to enslave us anymore. We're not going to be servants of servants anymore. We're going to bash people's heads against our great wall of China, which we're saying now is a great steel wall that 1.4 billion people have built. So in our next part in this series, we're going to be looking at the evidence of the historians, the geographers, the lexicographers, the Hebrew language experts, uh, which will give us the evidence that the Sinites, the Canaanite descendants, migrated across to China. How China came to be where it is today, uh, originating across uh, after the flood in the Middle East. So please move on now to part two.